All right, good morning, Shmita fam, and welcome back to True Crime Loser. How's it going? I hope you're going well. All right, if you would like to support this channel, I got a Patreon link in the description. I would really appreciate it. So today, we're starting the next multi-day case, and we're going with the Craigslist Killer. And for this one, I want, to, I want you to start by picturing a 25-year-old girl in New Jersey, and she's been in New Jersey for a couple weeks, staying with her parents, and she normally lives in Boston with her boyfriend, who's in his second year of med school, and the reason she's in Jersey is because she had back surgery the year before, and she's just had a lot of trouble with it. There's been a lot of pain, and so she goes from Boston, where she lives with her boyfriend, once a month, um, even maybe even more than once a month, back to Jersey. She stays with her parents, and she gets her back work done by the doctor, and then she'll go back and live in Boston in the apartment that her and her boyfriend have rented. And like I said, her boyfriend's in his second year of medical school at Boston University. She, Megan, is um, also planning to go to medical school, but right now she can't work as we're talking about this. This is in 2009. So in 2009 at the time... She couldn't work or she couldn't start school because of the back injury. And so she's kind of in this health problem limbo. She's traveling home to Jersey, staying with your parents, you know. It kind of feels like your life's on hold when you are back at your parents, especially with health problems. And so she's been there for a couple weeks, staying at her parents, trying to get her back figured out. You know, I mentioned her name's Megan. And so Megan... She's just ready to go back to Boston and be with her boyfriend, be in her own apartment, not be in her parents' house, get over this back stuff. And um, so she's excited to head back to Boston. As she's heading, as she's leaving the house, her mom warns her. She says, hey, Megan, be careful. You know how moms have that just intuition? And she says, Megan... You know, she's talk, the mom's talking to her 25-year-old daughter. And she says, Megan, be careful. There's these someone was killed in Boston or there's these there's a someone attacking women in Boston and she and you know Megan says okay thanks mom for sure I'll I'll look out for it and she heads back to Boston and what her mom was referring to was the week previous um, an escort who had been traveling around, had landed on Boston as her next city to try to make a little money. And this escort posted a ad on Craigslist saying, you know, you want to hang out with a hot blonde? Call this number. And uh, right after midnight, she gets a call. And it's a guy saying, you know, how much? The old the old how much phone call, and she tells him it's 200 and he said, okay, I'll come to your hotel room, and he gets to her hotel room, and too bad it wasn't Mike DiPolito. She probably would have left with a house, but it happened to be a big old white boy with a baby face named Philip Markoff, and uh, Phil... When the escort saw Phil at first, she felt instantly safe because he's this big, clean-cut, preppy-looking white boy, baby face. Um, and so she, in an interview, had said that she had felt safe instantly when she saw him. And so they go in her hotel room, and she closes the door. And immediately when she closes the door, she turns around, and there's a gun in her face. And it's Philip is standing there, and, and he's calm. And it, she says that it looks like he's done it before. And he says, you know, if you, if you do everything I say, no harm is going to come to you. And he ties her up with 
white plastic zip ties and he rummages around the room looking for the money that she has and the escort also sees that he takes a couple pieces of underwear from her underwear somewhere Russ just deep far in the Canadian jail system just perked up hmm? underwear hello so he takes a couple uh, pairs of her underwear and leaves and you know she wriggles out of the zip ties and calls the police and then goes down to the police station the next day and you know says oh yeah also too is he takes the underwear and then he's wearing black leather gloves but he takes his gloves off for whatever reason maybe so his fingers work better to there's a roll of black tape so he tapes her mouth shut but he touches the tape with his bare hands and then also if you remember he called her phone to set up the meeting so he sits there on her phone for a little bit while she's tied up trying to delete his number off her phone which he does but also he's just touching it all over with his little grubby fingers so she goes down to the cops the next day you know, armed robbery, they do an investigation and, um, you know, and time moves on. And then two nights later, they get a phone call from a hotel, a different hotel in Boston, that there has been a murder. And same thing. And this poor woman, it was named Joe Lissa. And same thing, just a troubled life. Actually, her friends say she was getting it turned back on the right direction, but had just kind of live lived a troubled life, ended up escorting, probably never ideal. And um, same thing, had made a date, had made an appointment with someone, invited him to their hotel room. And But this one was, her face was smashed in with a butt of a gun, and she was shot three times. This is two nights after the uh the the previous one where the the blonde escort didn't die and so the blonde escort a couple nights later you know she's probably just getting over this horrific arm robbery that she went through but a couple nights later the cops call her and they say hey we may have a picture of the guy that assaulted you would you mind you know taking a look at it and so she was like yeah definitely i and so they show her a picture of this big old preppy looking white boy with a baby face walking through a lobby of a hotel. And she goes, oh crap, that's him. That's the guy that attacked me. And how did you get such a clear picture of him in the lobby? Like you didn't have this. They had pictures of, you know, real blurry pictures of him walking through the lobby of the, um, of the night that it happened to her. And they were like, well, actually... This is a different night. This is, this was last night, and he actually murdered an escort last night. And so you can imagine that the escort that wasn't killed, that had, this had just happened to, but she had gotten away, had this feeling of like, oh my God. You know, I could have been just as easily. And, um, and so now there's a murder and they know it's connected. So they now, now they know there's this big preppy looking white boy wandering around Boston, assaulting escorts, murdering escorts in hotels. And then a couple nights later, 60 miles away in like a suburb or something, it happens again. But th that, this time, same thing. Craigslist uh, makes an appointment, comes to her hotel room, but in this case, the woman had her husband, who was kind of her husband and business partner and pimp, the pimp husband dude, was sitting in the lobby of the hotel waiting for a text that everything was okay. So same thing, Philip goes in the room. So this is a night or two after he... It had gone wrong in the hotel and he had killed her. So just think, he had killed someone in a hotel room and just two nights later, he's already doing it again. So it wasn't like he was so freaked out or so 
sad that it happened two nights ago that he was like, I'm done with this crazy, stupid plan to rob people in hotel rooms. So he's doing it again, which to me is just nuts. So same thing. She closes the door and a gun comes out right in her face. And this time, though, she describes it. The first escort described it as very calm, very much I've done this before, you know, gun in the face. But this time... She they describes it as he was sh- visibly nervous and the gun was shaking. So maybe he was just, you know, the night before he had killed someone. So maybe it was just thrown off. But anyway, so the husband, the pimp husband, sitting in the lobby waiting for a text, being like, "Yo, everything's good." Text doesn't come because right when she closes the door, the gun pops out in her face. And uh, so. The husband is sitting there, and same thing. His husband's sitting there calling over and over and over again. And by this time, Philip had tied her up in the same white zip ties as everybody else. And he's looking around the room, rummaging around, and the, her phone just is going off. And so this is making Phil really nervous. He's going, you know, why is your phone going off? Who is calling you over and over and over again? And she's just like, I don't know. And... Um, all of a sudden, the pimp husband, just like the movies, has a room key. The pimp husband, deet, comes in the room. Well, this isn't ideal for Phil, so he puts points the gun right at the pimp husband's face. And there's kind of a moment of like, what is going on? And he, the pimp husband, which is funny because he just totally bails on his escort wife. The pimp husband turns around and runs down the hall. He's just out. He's like, you know what? I'm out. I'm leaving my wife to deal with this gunman on her own. And so he takes off down the hall one way. Well, Phil, he's done too. So he takes off the other way down the hall. And once again, once he's out of the hall, he's... Um, caught on security camera, walking around, same big old nose, same big old white boy looking dude, uh, same coat, same shoes, same hat, same posture. So he's caught again leaving, and um, and they don't catch him again. And again, they call the cops, they find the footage, they're like, all right, so the, here, here we go again. Well, now we're up to the day where, you know, poor Megan has been in Jersey trying to get her back figured out. And now she is heading back to Boston to reunite with her boyfriend, Philip Markoff, in their apartment. And her mom, like I said, warns her, hey, hey, be careful. There's a guy in Boston. And she's like, oh, mom, I'll be careful. You know, and so she gets back to their to their apartment. I'm sure there's a hef- baby. So good to see you. How's your back feeling? I missed you. It was great to see my parents, but it was rough living with them. I felt like I was 13 again, and I'm good to be glad to be back. I love you, baby. You know, I'm sure there was something like that. And in the meantime. The cops are furiously trying to figure out what the hell is going on. And a break, a huge break in the case is one of Joe Lissa, the poor girl that was killed, one of her friends goes through her emails and actually locates an email from that night from her 10 o'clock appointment. And turns it over to the cops. So the cops now have their computer nerds do what they do. And the computer nerds track the IP address from where the emails came from. And they track it to a little apartment in Quincy in Boston. And so they go and stake out Quincy. And the the apartment that they track the IP address for is rented by a Philip Markoff, a big old preppy looking white boy. So they go and they stake out the apartment and sure enough, you know, they got the pictures of the hotel 
of this guy walking around. And sure enough, the door opens after staking it out and a big old tall looking white boy with a nose looking the same. And they're like, all right. So they start following him. They start following him everywhere he goes just to see what he's doing. And But Megan's back in town at this point. And so they're following him around. And Megan and her... Or Megan and Phil, that one of their things that they do for fun is they drive from Boston where they live to Foxwoods in Connecticut, Foxwoods Casino, and Phil will sit there and gamble for a while. Megan doesn't gamble. She likes to watch, and then they'll gamble for a while, and then they go and eat dinner somewhere together, and then they get a cheap hotel at the casino because he gambles, and that's one of their... Couple, fun couple things that they do together. Well, the Boston police are furiously trying to follow Phil, keep the investigation going um, smoothly, and just try to figure this out. And um, as they're following him around, they get a little nervous because they see him and Megan come out with um, with suitcases and they get in a car and they get on the highway. And so now there's police following them on the highway being like, all right, should we pull them over? Should we let them go? It's kind of this frantic moment because it's like, shit, are they leaving? What's going on? And in the meantime, they were trying to get a picture because now that they know it's possibly Phil, they get like his I don't know, college picture. They get like a picture of him off the internet of his face. And they were in the process of getting a photo lineup. So a bunch of blonde looking dudes in a row with Philip, one of them. They were trying to get that to the first escort to try to say this is him. Because they think if she says this is him, you know, they got the IP address. Hopefully they can get fingerprints off the tape and off her phone. They got all of the footage of him walking around in the lobbies after he does it. And so they're thinking, you know, if we can just get her to identify him in the photo lineup, that'll be enough to arrest him for murder. And so it's this frantic thing. He's driving. That, that first escort is, is in New York City now. She had moved on to New York. So they send this photo lineup. They email it to de- a detective in New York City. All the while, Philip and Megan are on the highway driving, you know, with suitcases with cops secretly behind them, you know, hoping that they don't get to a border of another state. And the New York detective gets the photo lineup, rushes to the first escort's hotel room, shows it to her. Immediately, she's looking through it and goes, boom, this is him. And she says, I'm one million percent sure, even more than... Dahlia Dippa didn't do anything, 5,000% sure. She's 1 million percent sure, baby. So the New York detective picks up the phone and says, she identified him. And it's just this hectic thing. He's almost about ready to cross into Connecticut, and they get the phone call. She identified him, do it, make the move. And so, boom, all these lights come on behind him, you know, bunch of police cars. And as you can imagine, Megan, she's back in. The, she's back. She's hanging out with her boyfriend. You know they're broke. Um, we find out that they're totally broke, no money. You know that college kid, brutal broke. Uh, they're totally living off of Phillips student loans. He's taking out student loans for med school, and they're paying all their bills, all their rent, everything. Everything they do is off of those loans. And, but when Megan describes it, it's a, it's like we're broke, but we're gonna be okay because Phillips gonna be a doctor, and I'm gonna be a doctor. He's two years in, so. Um, The way she talks about it is we're broke college kids, but, you know, Phil's going to be a doctor, so we'll be all right. And so the lights come on. And so you can imagine the surprise that Megan is, you know, she's looking in the rearview mirror and there's 
all these cop cars with their lights on behind them. And you can probably think of the feeling that Philip is thinking, having the week that he just had prior to this. And, um, and so they kind of look at each other and they're like, what is going on? And the cops, you know, approached the car and said, hey, we'd like to talk to you. There's been this ongoing investigation. And of course, Megan is like, what the hell is going on? And Phil's like, I don't know, what is going on? And they take Megan and Phil down to the police station. And they interrogate them at the same time in different rooms. And it's very fascinating. And I'm going to link... I'm going to link... Uh, the interrogations for both of them, both Megan, the girlfriend, who has no idea, no idea that her boyfriend is this Craigslist killer that leaves, leads this completely double life where he's going out in the middle of the night and killing hookers and, um, you know, she has no idea. So she sits down in the interrogation room thinking, you know, she's got nothing to hide. And she doesn't. And it's, you can tell, you know, she tells the truth. We listen to a lot of interrogations where the person just lies their ass off the whole time. Well, she sits down and tells the truth. Well, as you can guess, and it feels like the truth. You can feel it in your bones. It's like, this girl's telling the truth. Well, you can guess that in the other room down the hall, old Philly boy, not so much. He seems to have a hard, harder time remembering what happened the week before than his girlfriend does. But, yeah, I think that's where I'm going to cut it off. We'll get into the interrogations tomorrow. Um, this is a wild one. I don't, I don't think that this one... I think that I'll be able to do this one this week. Because as most of you know, or as you'll find out, the court case doesn't really... Something comes up and it doesn't really, it ends quicker than you might think. But um, yeah, thank you to everybody that has liked and subscribed and commented and participated. It really does help me out. Check out Phillip's um, interrogation tonight. If you haven't, check out his girlfriends. I think they're both really worth a watch. And uh, I was going to wait into this at another video, but I'll just give you guys a little sneak preview. Look at those. Can you see it? Coffee mugs coming soon. Why? Stab and why?